Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Library 2.017. Today we have a mini conference on expertise, competencies, and careers uh, with Julie Beth Todaro and John Bertot, Valerie Gross, and Eileen Abels. Thanks everybody for being here. We're going to give you one second now for those of you who are participating live to indicate where you are in the world. Look to the left of the map. You're going to click on the star icon. It may spread out and give you some choices. If you click it again, you'll get a star that you can click on the map. You can also put your information in the chat. Looks like we have lots of North America, some in the British Isles, New Zealand. Very fun to see where you're participating from, Australia. Keep that information going in the chat, but we have a full hour, so I'm going to move this right ahead. The founding partner for the Library 2.017 conferences and for the Library 2.0 events in general is the School of Information at San Jose State University. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sandra Hirsch. Thank you, Sandy, for all that you do. And thank you, Steve. Uh, our school, San Jose State uh, School of Information, is thrilled to be sponsoring and co-chairing the Library 2.0 virtual conference for our seventh year. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to um, the first of our 2017 mini conferences. Um, in addition to this mini conference that we're running today, uh, which focuses on us um, as information professionals, specifically on our expertise, competencies, and careers, we will also be having two other mini conferences um, later this year, one that's focused around digital literacy, which will be an important conversation in June, and also one on makerspaces that we'll be holding in October. But Let's focus on what we're doing today. And I'm very pleased to introduce our American Library Association president, Julie Todaro, who has par partnered with us on today's mini conference. Um, as ALA's president, um, Julie's um, ALA presidential initiative has been all around what she calls libraries transform the expert in the library. So today's conference is directly related to this very important focus area and uh, we're thrilled to be having that conversation today that will also be continued um, and I'm sure Julie will mention this at the um, upcoming American Library Association conference in Chicago in June 2017. Uh, Julie has a great great background um, that she's been a library manager for over 40 years and she has experience in all types of libraries and library settings. But she's currently serving as Dean of Library Services at the community, Austin Community College. She's also authored several books, including Library Management for the Digital Age, A New Paradigm, and also a book called Mentoring A to Z. I can't think of a better person to be uh, focusing on this important topic. And we're so thrilled that she's squeezed us into what is a very busy day and a very busy time in the life of an ALA president where there's many things that she needs to attend to you, but I know that this topic is very near and dear to her heart, so we're thrilled to um, have her uh, engage in this conversation with us today. So I'd like to turn it over to Julie to uh, kick us off on the opening keynote panel, and I'm looking forward to our conversation over the next few hours. Welcome, Julie, and welcome to our keynote speakers. Thank you, Sandy. I, I can't tell you uh, how much I appreciate the opportunity to be the focus of this uh, webinar. Uh, it's far-reaching and it provides us with an opportunity to reach a much broader audience about uh, the importance of expertise. Um, the, the idea of competencies and expertise is something that I've been interested in since my dissertation. And I started out as a children's librarian, and I was always amazed every day when I went to work that people would say, yeah, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do this. And so I became fascinated by the fact that I was one of the few people in the library who 
absolutely had to have all of the knowledge base um, because I staffed all the reference desks. And so it, uh, it was, uh, as I said, the focus of a survey that I did, a national survey, and I got about 62 to 70 percent response rate, which is pretty unbelievable for uh, dissertation research. And it became uh, a never-ending uh, focus to, to take a look at what competencies are expected of people, how they're reflected in job descriptions. And then the natural is where do you get these? Do you get these in library education? Do you get these through continuing education, self-directed professional development, through mentoring? So it became a long-standing focus and interest with me, and I decided that uh, my ALA initiative would have a great deal of focus on us as individuals. If, if I say to a librarian, and I can stop a conversation in two seconds by saying, what's your expertise? And they're always humble. Uh, sometimes they have difficulty in stating what their strengths are, uh, how well they're liked, um, what, and certainly what they're an expert in. So I began to do that about two years ago. Audiences got used to me doing that. People at ALA are sort of used to me doing that. But if you introduce yourself to me, I will ask you what your expertise is. I use the word expert in all my interviews. And I love seeing it come back in print and people using it naturally to talk about expert librarians. So all the initiatives for library tr libraries transform really focus on us as a profession, and I'm proud to be able to uh, make that opportunity uh, available on a much broader scale. I have a little bit of information today uh, with some PowerPoint uh, information that uh, provides uh, a background on uh, uh, the whole idea of what libraries transform are. The ideas uh, have been explored by a number of teams of mine, and these teams are from all types and sizes of libraries. And uh, if you could pull those up now, Steve, and we'll be able to go through the PowerPoint. Sorry, Julie, what did you want me to pull up? My PowerPoint. I'm sorry, Julie, I didn't get a PowerPoint set from you. Uh, I sent it this morning about 5 a.m., and it says my connection to the teleconference has just failed. I got the same message, Am too, I that on? I do hear you, Julie. How odd. Okay. All right. So let's just move on. Um, the, uh, the expertise concept uh, at the American Library Association is built out in a number of different ways. And the most important concept is the idea of having uh, a brand to the American Library Association, Libraries Transform. The brand is visualized by a series of very colorful banners that focus on contemporary information. For example, today's uh, newest uh, banner is um, fake news. It actually, they all start with because, because fake news has real world consequences. And I'm, I'm particularly pleased to see us spring into action and create PowerPoint um, uh, ideas for programs because statements for sale. In addition to that, anyone who wants to create their own banners need only go to the Libraries Transform website, download the banners, and create their own. So you can not spend a dime and literally rebrand your library. In addition to that, we have an expertise because statement that says, because the expert in the library is you. And I have a series of name tags that have uh, some flexibility to them, so you can download them yourself. But basically, it says, Libraries Transform, my name is, and then I'm an expert in. 
And the examples I use are Makerspace, do it yourself, research, uh, helping you get an A plus on your project, uh, working with your two year old at story time. So the expertise factor uh, is something that I want to continue to brand in a very visual way with what's happening. We have uh, several links to websites. ILoveLibraries.org has a Libraries Transform page, as does the American Library Association. And the people in charge of my different aspects of the initiative have been creating an incredible amount of content, uh, 21st century job titles, 21st century job descriptions, sets of competencies that are required by individuals, uh, and in addition to that, a number of other opportunities for uh, putting things on the ALA web that are free to assist people in competency development. So let's take a look at a few of these. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Libraries Transform is an initiative of the American Library Association. It is a, uh, a five-year initiative. So you're going to have a number of different rollouts of this in a number of different ways. At the core of the concept is because transformation is a niche, uh, uh, critical to the communities we serve. And our focus is the value of us as professionals, the impact we make, and the critical role that we play in 21st century digital age. We have some key messages that are uh, important to us in terms of advancing the hybrid legacy we have, which is the legacy of reading and books, as well as a digitally inclusive society. We have, uh, as I mentioned, some really cool because banners. I uh, mentioned the because fake news has real world consequences. And you will see a great many other because statements flooding out, some of which have been created by you as you suggest them and add them to the website. We really are pushing the idea of branding yourself. So in my library, we actually put the banners outside the library to bring people in. We have librarians creating their own. And a huge number of librarians in this particular point in our history have asked to create more inclusive and welcoming banners welcoming everyone into the library and making because banners in a variety of different um, languages so that their community can truly feel welcome when they come in. I always steer people in this day and age in terms of, so what's expected of me when I get out in the field? What is it that I should be looking at in library education? I steer people to the Center for the Future of Libraries. And you see the trends arrow on the left-hand side. And that, that shows you, and I'll show you this in a minute, a number of different incredible pages that we have on future and how libraries sit in the middle of the future and in some cases ahead of future trends. I urge you to subscribe to uh, the uh, it's a wonderful listserv that's called Read for Later, which of course compels me to open it immediately when I get it. But their articles are not in library resources. Instead, the articles are in uh, every other field but ours. And then the director of the center brings it back to us. Just a few of the trends that you see, aging advances, anonymity, badging. Badging, of course, is directly related to our professional development and our own sets of competencies and strengths. And ALA is uh, experimenting with a number of different badging opportunities at this time. Connected learning is where the arrow is pointing you here. And connected learning is a very interesting tab that talks about how library schools are, in fact, using competencies, the whole idea of competencies, to move people through their educational program and put them on path so that they can uh, be ready for the workforce and then learn how to update themselves as they move along. As I mentioned, we're uh, a second part of the transform. Here's a look at the name tags. And uh, I've, I have, as I said, pop out 
areas of the name tags in the store that are, I'm an expert in do it yourself. So although we sell these name tags, there's no profit here and we have all the content free on the Libraries Transform website for you to download. The most important thing is that you brand yourself. At the end of my term, which is coming in June, I did have it down to the days and the hours because it's been a hard year. Uh, we're going to have a 21st century human resources playbook coming out and that playbook will be linked from a number of places in ALA, but primarily a site called Human Resources or HRDR. And there are four things here that we're uh, providing for you. One is the value of expertise uh, and librarians and library workers value statements about the services and resources that we personally provide and what that means to a setting. We're going to be doing a review of ALA's core competency statements. We are going to be linking to an ever-growing set of competencies that are uh, available to the different divisions. And on the chat box, I saw a woman who has a technical services background and is looking for a job. And one of the things that I urge employers to do and I urge students to do is go to the website, look at what Alex is doing, which is the uh, area of ALA that is on technical services, and see what their competency statements are to see what 21st century expectations of technical services librarians are supposed to be. And finally, as I mentioned, we're going to have 21st century job descriptions and 21st century titles and uh, a lot of interesting links from the different affiliate organizations. For example, the Association of Research Libraries has been collecting job titles. SLA has been, Special Libraries Association has been collecting unique job descriptions and so have I. So it's been an interesting year as we try to hold on to what we have and to look forward in the best possible way. ALA is changing as we speak. We have learning tracks at conferences that also provide you with certificates and badging so you can move on in your own development. We have uh, expansive mentoring opportunities for people both in general and in specific areas of the field and also at certain levels in your career. We have a dedicated space in the exhibit hall for experiential opportunities with technology we make space, uh, all sorts of different look what we've done that go far beyond the idea of the poster sessions of the past but literally petting zoos, things that allow you first-hand knowledge of what's happening out there. One of the most exciting things for me is uh, our, one of our classic competency areas, and that is assisting people with book clubs. We've used book clubs for bibliotherapy in the country. We've used them in high schools to uh, illustrate for kids conflict resolution. We use uh, just for pure entertainment and enjoyment. And so we are consolidating all the content that we have and teaming with publishers, Penguin, uh, to make uh, the most important contribution is supporting us. And what is particularly ex exciting is they brought in Sarah Jessica Parker and she's going to be the captain of the club and she will be offering uh, an online uh, book club as we move through the year. She'll have four Parker's picks throughout the year along with discussion questions on each one of those. So I really push people to show their expertise in that area. Rusa is involved, Alf is involved, Yalf is involved, so I'm very excited about the book club and how that's going to be a standard in our field. Finally, we have added a civilization series to the conference so that we have a series on the weekends that are a really a strong look at, at what's happening in uh, the uh, profession today. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker will be in Chicago on Saturday giving my Saturday uh, early evening program and we'll be doing the virtual launching of the book club at that time. So we're very interested and excited to hear from three people who I have known and admired for a long time and have been lucky enough to work with. 
John Berteau is one of our first people who uh, I'm going to introduce, and I'm going to give you a little bit of in-depth information about each person, and then uh, very briefly, and then I'll, I'll just segue from their presentation to the next person. John Berteau, uh, I'll talk extemporaneously, and then I'll read a little bit. Uh, when I first joined the ALA board, they were very excited because they had identified an expert in the field uh, who they felt could really uh, present us with a research paper that talked about the whole gold standard in terms of library education, what we should expect, what you should expect as students, and what uh, employers should expect as people were exiting graduate education. So we were very excited at that time to have uh, John do a, a paper for us. In general, uh, he's the current Associate Provost for Faculty Affairs and Professor at University of Maryland's iSchool. He has served as the iSchool's first MLIS Program Director for the past uh, seven years, six years. And during his time in that role, he launched what I had first heard of concerning him, and that was re-envisioning the MLS initiative. And the whole point of this was to explore the future of librarianship and the curriculum. Many of you have been enrolled in, or if you're a recent graduate, that you've had the opportunity to learn. In addition to these initiatives, John has spent two decades of his life uh, redesigning, assessing MLIS curriculum as he's moved through his career, and he served as the director of a number of IMLS-funded uh, innovative uh, curriculum projects. So his expertise is broad in terms of what he's done. So he's a curriculum specialist. He's certainly a specialist in the future of the graduate program and in attaining the competency set that we, as an employer, require of students coming out of the field. The second person we have is Valerie Gross. I've also admired Valerie for a long time because she also has done something revolutionary. Her entire focus is libraries equal education. She's received a number of awards, Innovator of the Year. Her library received a Library of the Year Award. As she has assessed, valued, and rebranded her library, and the value that it brings to the community, specifically in the area of education. And if you don't already know it, federal government does not see us officially as educational environments, which cuts out a lot of grant money for us. So Valerie's work is an incredible boon to the field in terms of her expertise and, and what she brings to um, the entire idea of what the public library is there for. You know you do education each and every day, and she certainly exemplifies that in her award-winning library. Eileen is dean and professor at another one of my favorite library schools, Simmons. I've known people from Simmons for many years. She has more than 30 years of experience as an educator, and prior to her work as an academic, she held several positions as a special librarian in the field. She was also part of the team that developed the 2003 competencies for special librarians for the Special Library Association. So we were especially interested in her take 14 to 15 years later on special libraries and any standard, core, or unique and new uh, competencies expected. In addition, uh, in 2014, Eileen and two collaborators, and this is the most exciting project, Linda Smith and Lynn Howarth in Toronto secured funding from the IMLS for a national planning grant. And their planning grant was entitled Envisioning Our Information Future and the most important part, how to educate for it. We have a number of different, so far, proofs of concept from the study, and these proofs of concept are being developed and tested and piloted, and they will assist in shaping library education for the future. So our first speaker today is John Berteau, and I'm very excited to present him. Welcome, John. I'm going to turn off my talk and my video, and we can't wait to hear what you have to say. All right. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm hopeful you can hear me. Um, 
And uh, thanks so much for that, um, uh, Julie. So one quick thing that um, I just want to say off the top, um, since we split this up a little bit today, I'll be focusing primarily on the context that's given rise to um, you know, sort of rethinking LIS education and quite frankly, part of the re-envisioning libraries and the future of libraries um, that you've been hearing so much about and, and as Julie has been talking about um, moments ago. Um, and I also have to give a, a thank you also to Valerie as um, uh, she serves and, and served on our, our advisory board throughout our re-envisioning the MLS process. So uh, there's a lot of people um, to whom we're grateful for what they've um, contributed to, to our work um, with um, sort of rethinking LIS education, certainly in Maryland and, and elsewhere. So one thing, um, uh, I'll go through this rather quickly because I think we want to hear from, from Valerie and Eileen about um, their projects and, and how they've been looking at the library space. Um, but from our sort of standpoint, um, we were really trying to look at um, sort of the changing landscape that existed um, within sort of library service in our communities and more broadly what it meant um, sort of in the information space, right? So, so when we launched our initiative, um, it was right sort of at um, what well, some people officially called the tail end of the recession, but we still have lingering effects of it. And we're really trying to look at um, a confluence of factors um, that, that were happening within our communities, within our profession, um, certainly within uh, sort of the, the LIS space, as it were, uh, and trying to create a process um, for rethinking um, our education ecosystem, if you will, for jobs of the future uh, and how we might um, uh, predict um, where things were going to be in four or five years, maybe six years, because quite frankly, if you know anything about academia, it takes roughly five years to fix anything in curriculum. I mean, you can tweak, uh, but a real shift um, takes a, a fairly long time. Um, so we looked at things like our changing information, technology, economic, social community environments. Um, we also have a changing political um, context that I think we just need to acknowledge, uh, where we have the people questioning the value of culture, arts, and science. Um, in fact, you know, uh, one of the things I'm sure Julie's been busy with, along with others at ALA, is um, the current budget being proposed by, by our president you know, zeroes out IMOS um, and NEA and various other agencies that broadly represent um, culture and arts. Um, and we also have this questioning of science and scientific inquiry as part of that process. Um, clearly, you know, we live in a world where facts are optional. And so this is all creating this great uncertainty around our various um, information spaces and how we as a profession uh, respond um, to, to those um, consistently uh, changing context uh, and what do we need to do to prepare um, graduates of our programs to be able to, to handle that very fluid and dynamic kind of environment. At the same time, um, there are this, there's this broader um, context of shifting needs and expectations where we're sort of asking questions like, you know, what's public value? Um, we have different content expectations from a variety of different groups um, and, and user communities that we might serve. And we have different content delivery and access expectations, right? And so we have this large mix um, that's creating a, a very different um, set of expectations and needs that, that we're being asked to met in a variety of different settings. Um, we also have a, a situation of external and internal pressure, right? So there is no shortage of discussion around what libraries of the future should be. Um, and interestingly to me is a lot of this is coming from outside the library space, but certainly within the library space or partnered with libraries and various others. But you know, there are a variety of, of studies that are looking at this and initiatives that are looking at this um, by Pew, by the Aspen Institute, by IDO, Next Library, right? So you have sort of this external pressure that's kind of pushing us towards a future um, with which uh, we may or may not agree, um, but regardless, um, people are trying to shape the future of, of libraries and information organizations. Um, and as part of that, how do we think about sort of the education that we might provide to prepare our, our future information professionals? There's also been bad press. Um, I mean, Forbes seems to perennially put uh, the MLS degree as like one of the worst careers uh, out there. And in fact, they did it again, you know, uh, recently in 2016. Um, you know, so, so you have that kind of pressure. And then sort of we also have the internal pressure 
around places like hacklibraryschool.com and Annoyed Librarian, right? So all of this um, comes together uh, to create, I think, a, a broader context uh, within which we need to consider um, uh, LIS education. But I also want to provide, since I am you know, an academic, I have to throw some data out. Um, I also want to uh, avail you of some uh, trend analysis um, in terms of how certainly public libraries in the US um, are being used and have been used over roughly the last um, 11 years. And these are the most recent data from 2014 is the most recent data that we have from, from IMLS. Um, but I thought I'd lay it out over um, a period of time so you can see some of the trend analysis, right? So, you know, uh, and so if you look at circulation per capita, you, um, you know, went up uh, and then now it's on the decline. And I'll talk about sort of that middle hump momentarily when I, when I come through. Uh, uh, reference per capita has been steadily declining. Um, so uh, although this, you know, I think you need to be careful on this. I mean, I think what's in part what's happening, at least anecdotally, is that um, the ready reference stuff, the quick questions like how tall is the Empire State Building is being answered elsewhere, like through Google and other places. Um, so the numbers are going down. But from my uh, discussions with librarians, the intensity um, and the time commitment to the transactions that use that are sort of captured as reference transactions are, are increasing, right? Um, because people are coming in um, with different expectations of, of guidance and assistance, whether it's for education or life issues. Um, so, so I think you have to be a little careful when, when you look at um, the, the numbers like these. Um, visits, uh, you know, uh, climbed for a bit and are, are also um, declining in recent years. Um, even public access computer sessions and the, the uses of public access computers in libraries is on the decline. I suspect some of this is because people come with their devices, um, so or increasingly come with their devices. But um, you know, all that investment in sort of that public access technology or public access computer infrastructure um, is something to to consider um, in in this kind of a of a usage context. But um, program attendance is, is climbing steadily and, and is, is very much on the rise. Um, so we're, what you can gather from this, um, if you, if you think through all of these, um, oh, and I, let me, let me, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. I'm sorry. Um, also, I would say that we have a change in staffing, right? So the average number of librarian, um, FTEs, those have librarian titles, um, you know, has either stayed steady at the smaller libraries or has been, um, uh, somewhat declining, um, uh, in the larger libraries, particularly in the very large library systems. Um, and then the, the numbers of, average numbers of MLS, um, uh, librarians in, in the various public libraries in the U.S. has also been um, either flat or declining over time, right? So I think, you know, these provide you with a sense of where we are um, in a particular space, in a particular usage environment, and that's the public libraries in the U.S., um, but it gives you a sense of the change that's occurring in, in how people are coming to the library and what they're using us for and the kinds of experiences that they're looking for. So some concluding comments based on these trends, right? You You've seen a general reduction in staff since the recession. I also would say that our, the usage bump, which you saw sort of that middle year spread from like 2008 until like 2012, sort of that recession bump, I would call it, um, is gen in general over um, and is in some cases lower than pre-recession numbers. Um, however, programs and engagement um, are very much a growth industry, right? So people are coming to the library with um, a, a different reason uh, for different kinds of, of um, uh, services that they may want to avail themselves of, and it may not be sort of the trad more traditional ones. I also would say that we're sort of in transition, and I think Valerie will certainly speak to this and Eileen as well. Um, you know, we do have a changing job landscape. You know, fewer jobs, at least in libraries, that doesn't mean elsewhere. Um, so I think there's a potential to, to apply your skills uh, from uh, an MLS degree in other venues. Um, and we certainly have had a questioning of the need for an MLS for all positions um, within libraries, certainly all professional positions uh, within a library. But we're also witnessing what I would consider a fairly dramatic shift in a value proposition, right? Um, so we're in the middle of a transition from what I would 
would say is we're valuable because we're used, right? Things like circulations and visits and reference and other things. To we're valuable because we make a difference, right? So outcome and impact kind of approach. And you've seen a number of projects um, uh, around that. Um, one funded by IMOS is Measures That Matter. It's a more recent project. The Public Library Association has Project Outcome. Um, and this shift in value proposition also brings with it, I think, um, different kinds of considerations for the skill sets um, that individuals need um, coming out of, of library schools. Um, and we've also had a fairly substantial shift in the paradigm, um, our service paradigm, from sort of what was true and true for, for you know, nearly two decades around sort of connecting people to information for their information problem solving um, around things like information behavior, learning, that kind of a narrative to really what I would consider um, uh, facilitating the solving of life challenges, um, facilitating engagement, and facilitating the overall experience um, that people will have when they come into our spaces. Um, so I think we're seeing a, a fairly um, a dramatic shift um, in the paradigm. And I think what Julie laid out with her um, initiatives, I think, is a reflection of that in many ways. So. Uh, sort of concluding a bit and and then turning this over um, to uh, Valerie to talk a bit more about some of the work that, that she's been doing at Howard County Public Library. Um, you know, we launched on our end sort of this notion of re-envisioning the MLS um, because quite frankly, um, when you're re-envisioning libraries, um, you have to think about the professionals and others who will be in those libraries to help you with that future state that, that you're, you're shooting for. Um, down uh, in, in the horizon. Um, so we were asking a series of key questions, and I think others were asking this at around the same time, which is, you know, so what does it mean to be a librarian? What's the value of an MLS degree? What does a future degree look like? What are the aptitudes and competencies that, that you know, MLS holding professionals should possess that are truly unique to the degree holders, right? And I think that's a very key question to ask. Um, and what sets of values um, do they bring that other professions don't? Um, and so so we were trying to um, put all of that into um, an initiative to really look at sort of the future of um, the information professionals who will be inside our, our library and other spaces. Um, lastly, I'll con uh, conclude, you know, these aren't necessarily new questions, right? I mean, I, I sort of joke, um, but it, it seems like our field likes to ask these questions about every 10 years, you know, like why are, you know, uh, what is it? Who are we? Uh, what is it that we do? What's our value proposition? Um, we we have this conversation um, uh, with a fair amount of regularity, but I would also say that it seems that given the current context and current realities that we've been facing, um, that it has taken on a bit more urgency in the last few years. Um, so with that, I will conclude, and I'll be happy to turn it over um, uh, for the next speaker. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate your your work and your study. And I would agree, same questions uh, in many ways, but I think there's an urgency for uh, talking about those questions uh, as specifically, but more importantly, uh, putting some answers together. You mentioned uh, the budget at the first part of this, and one of the core competencies that uh, we really search for is advocacy and uh, political savvy. Uh, and the role of the librarian in that and how does he or she work within an environment uh, that is a apolitical environment, partisan, bipartisan environment, and yet still uh, speak for our core values. Valerie uh, is, uh, as I said, a hero of mine because libraries equal education is just such an incredible part of our future because it's, uh, in my opinion, indicating where we really are going with this. And I think there's a real synchronous, synchronicity. It's not a word, let me know. Um, but I think there has to be a blending of what John was talking about with our statistics and with us articulating new data and new statistics so that we really do capture what John said are some of the, the competency areas and the, the amount of time we're spending on things and the kinds of reference we're doing and identifying those as education. Valerie? Thanks so much, Julie. It's such a pleasure to be part of this panel. Thanks, Julie, for all of your outstanding work. 
John and Eileen, uh, it's, it's really great to be on this, this panel. And Sandy, I want to thank you too. San Jose State University is my alma mater, so it holds a special place in my heart. And a final thank you to absolutely everyone out there participating today. You are leaders in this particular field, and you all have contributed immensely to Libraries Equals Education that has evolved over the past decade, thanks to your contributions to that. And thanks also for answering some questions about the expertise in the 21st century for libraries in this day and age. We had a Maryland Association of Public Library Administrators conference last week, and they contributed as well. So I wanted to mention that Libraries Equals Education really is both the foundation and the structure of today's topic, which is our expertise. I'll be using some examples from public libraries. However, the concepts can be adapted to all types of libraries. It's really important to recognize that while our purpose is timeless, our skills and expertise are ever evolving. So let's begin with an overview of libraries equals education. We will then migrate over to the areas of expertise structured under each of the three pillars. Libraries Equals Education is a growing movement across the world. And that is because in every area of the world, people don't understand always the value that we know we are. There's a disconnect. And so you'll see we go from being viewed as keepers of the book with the current symbol over to a powerful, simple, easy to remember, succinct, unifying, crystal clear message, we are what the world values most. We are education. And what we mean for public libraries is that we are educational institutions on equal footing with schools, colleges, and universities. And for school and academic libraries, and also for special libraries, I was once a law librarian, we are central to the success of the firm, to the school, students, and faculty, where we're on par with the most important department like math and science. And I would say even more important because we also support their curriculum, but we have our own. So not we support education. It's we are education. Do you see the difference? It's also important to understand the definition of education. Most people, and many of you, might be thinking of formal education that leads to a degree. And we certainly support the curriculum of the schools. We need to be partnering with them. But consider that the full, complete definition of education includes our favorite word, information about a subject matter. And it includes activities that impart knowledge. And an enlightening experience is education. It is education over a lifetime, informal education. The, the thought, the thinking, it is developing the process. It is lifelong. There are three components to this particular strategy. And the first is positioning yourself and viewing yourself as an educational institution or key department. The second component relates to today that we are all educators. So when Julie asks you what's your area of expertise, you can, of course, give your specialty. But I would suggest that you start out by saying, I am an educator. And then you can say you're an expert in teaching preschool classes, for instance. The second piece of this particular approach is to position everything you do under three pillars. And then the third component is to incorporate strategic vocabulary, swapping it out for traditional language that we just don't even think about. So for instance, to get rid of the word reference, because that really doesn't mean much to the outside world, and to say instead, research instead of programs, unless you are a part of the computer um, IT department, to say classes, seminars, workshops. So you'll hear me use strategic vocabulary throughout this presentation. The three pillars are important because they're timeless and they're also easy to remember. It's great fun for me to see that ALA is picking up on education. It's the first in its ease of libraries. So the language that we use 
as we talk about our expertise, can clearly convey the expectations so that nobody is fooled by what we do. That conveys it to the outside world. It also conveys it to ourselves. We'll take a look now under each of the three pillars, the areas of expertise, along with core pillars, uh, core principles, and business principles. Now, just a note, do not try and take notes. These slides will be available to you. I'm going to be flipping through some slides fairly quickly to give you a sense of what's under each of the three pillars. So just experience it, and then I'm happy to send you whatever you might like, including uh, more about the, the, three, the libraries equals education approach. But now we will take a look at each of the three pillars and then the, the principles. So we'll start with pillar one, self-directed education. That's anything you, experts, make available to our customers, students of all ages, so that they can find it on their own. It's e-content, and it is in print source. So it includes Hoopla. It includes Zinio now. And music collections like ukuleles, maybe you loan those, or bicycle repair kits. Our premium online research tools, online courses, world languages, launch pads, and the computers that are still used at all of our branches for customers, students of all ages, to come in and use the internet. And more recently, in addition to skills and expertise needed to beautifully disseminate and promote our library cards, the virtual cards that we are working with our school systems to give to all of the students. So those are just some examples. Now, what areas of expertise are needed to deliver that component of our curriculum? Well, as always, collection development cataloging, although it evolves and changes as to how we, we do that now because of technology. And there it is, IT, web design. Makerspaces, you want to do it yourself. It actually falls under pillar two, and there are actually instructors there to teach classes. Experience design, interior design, instructional design, all skills, expertise needed for this 21st century. Now let's look at pillar two. Research assistance and instruction. It is personalized, individual research, day in and day out, that you all deliver to our customers. And it is also instruction. We teach classes. Notice I didn't say we do story times. The verb is teach. So where it is classes, it conveys value. And it also infuses pride in our work and in what we do and sets a clear expectation for the role. So here's pillar two, just some examples. Research assistance. Passport services, children's classes, pre preschool classes, children's K through uh, 12, kindergarten field trips to the library, homework help, and subject matter expertise we now need. So to teach classes in environmental education, STEM education, that includes 3D animation, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, also adult classes, seminars, workshops falls under this particular pillar, as does adult basic education. So the skills here for research includes how to conduct a research interview. Notice that's not reference interview. And good listening skills. And teaching others expert research skills. Many of us still say information literacy. Again, the more powerful way to get full credit for what you do in this regard, we teach others expert research skills cultural awareness, and also IT skills, tech expertise to teach others how to use that iPad that they got for Christmas. In the instruction component of this particular pillar, we need teaching skills, presentation, facilitation skills, subject matter expertise in art, and music, and STEM, and American Sign Language. We also need to be able to adapt and to understand the importance of evaluation, so the development and the design of class content. And pillar three, instructive and enlightening experiences. This is bringing the community together to experience. It's author events. It's the summer reading kickoff. It's building community partnerships so that you can hold culture fests. If you lead to civility, it's bringing the community together on these important concepts. 
we all partner with our school systems to a certain extent. This falls under the third pillar, although that really does cross all three. We bring the schools into the library, the library into the schools. Maybe you hold Battle of the Books underneath that pillar three. And a final example is podcasting. We need to we need radio voices. We need to understand how to not use words that are going to be ah uh, and those those filler words. We need to practice not doing that. Uh, so under this third pillar, it's how to develop partnerships. Those are the skills we need to be learning, teaching, whether it's in high schools or in our own continuing education. The sales pitch. How to orchestrate an event. Those of you who have who have orchestrated events know just how complex and complicated it can be. Core principles, as always, intellectual freedom. Look at the second one. It's reworded just a bit. Equal opportunity in education for all at all stages of life. And then there's the concepts of respect and consideration, inclusiveness, empathy, and compassion. Business principles, people skills. Many of us still interview candidates who say, I want to work in the library because I like books. Well, that's great. You also need to like people and understand that. And one way is to focus on customer service, internal and external. Emotional intelligence. Leadership skills. And everyone a leader being a concept there. Leading the change. We want people to be leading change because change is now constant. Unlike our mission and our vision, which is education, which is solid, timeless, we will continuously change how we deliver on that. Communication skills. Verbal, nonverbal, and written communication is crucial in all kinds of ways. Marketing, social media, including how to deliver an interview constantly, we are being invited to be part of interviews, whether they're reported, uh, whether it's taped or video. I know Julie just came back from all kinds of interviews today. Julie Tadaro, our ALA president, so to develop, to develop those skills are really important. Political acumen, I know Julie mentioned those too. How to talk to an, an elected official, be a problem solver. And data skills, an ever-growing need. Organizational skills, project management, and lastly, capital projects, everything from A to Z, from how to close a branch, how to then deal with all of the process up through the grand opening, a complex series of steps that should be learned and can benefit everybody. And my final slide is titles. If we use titles that are intuitive, the outside world will understand and value that. So if I tell you I'm an instructor, what do you think I do? Teach. I'm a research specialist. You know I'm an expert at research. So consider a working title, instructor and research specialist. Customer service specialist is another one of those. If you call a circulation clerk a customer service specialist, he or she will puff up with pride and deliver even more extraordinary customer service just because it's in the title. So we are indeed in a new era that is truly exciting, much is the same, our vision and our crystal clear purpose. We are education, what the world values most, yet constantly changing in the areas of expertise that we continuously need to learn and sharpen. So thank you all very much. If you're interested more in libraries education, I've written a book on this. It is uh, noted here. Also, at the ALA conference, my, I will be introducing a session, and three other library systems will be talking about their experiences implementing Libraries Equals Education from Florida, Oklahoma, and Michigan. That will be called, You've Earned It, Now Get the Respect You Deserve. It's going to be held on, on Monday. So thank you all. Valerie, hey, thank Julie, you so much. Julie, this is Steve. Uh -huh. So we're obviously very tight on time. Uh -huh. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let all of the top of the hour presenters know that we will start five minutes late the next okay. set of sessions. But we have to, Eileen's, Eileen's queued up. Those of you who are participating, if there is a session you're going to go to the next hour, do get it queued up and get the link ready so you can go right in. Those poor presenters will feel badly if, if the people show up very late to their rooms. 
So we're going to give Eileen, if we can, the full 10 minutes. Welcome, Eileen. Thanks, Julie. I'm going to go very quickly through the first slide so that we don't get too far behind. I, Julie mentioned the project that I'm working on with Linda Smith and Lynn Howarth about revisioning library and information science education. This is an example of a vis the work of a visual scribe that our facilitators enlisted at our national forum, the planning grant. And um, I will be giving links at the end, so I'll, I'll go quickly through this, but you can follow up on the links that I'm providing to our project website. And then I hope you'll all be with us at ALA in June so I can continue the conversation. So we brought together more than 50 leaders from a variety of backgrounds, including uh, librarians, archivists, museum directors, educators, digital humanities scholars, futurists, artists, architects, content providers, and information technology entrepreneurs to talk about envisioning our information future and then ultimately how to educate for it. So as Julie mentioned, we have several proofs of concept that came out of the conversations, and I'll be referring to those momentarily. I think, though, that the reason we launched this project, and you know that University of Maryland launched something similar, and many of the public librarians and academic librarians are having sessions about um, you know, the future of libraries and Julie's transform, or if you're going to transform libraries, uh, you need to transform library and information science education, as John said earlier. And I think John gave, did a great background uh, job of giving a background on the change and the world around us that will resonate as I talk about some of our results. So we have, uh, we did some data gathering at the New England Library Association and followed up at IFLA in 2016 asking what knowledge, skills, and abilities will be required for your information professionals to help your organization achieve goals over the next five years. So many of these uh, were mentioned by Valerie, so I just want to say that NILA participants gave us some of these in this chart, and then IFLA had a, uh, we had an interactive poster, and they voted, and th these are the number of votes showing what came up at the top. So some are directly related to curriculum, and some are related to soft skills that we want our graduates to have. These were new ideas in this slide, and again, I'm not going to leave it here very long, but again, a lot of these were mentioned by Valerie. So what you're we're here to hear me talk about then is what does this mean for LIS education? And we need to design curricula focused on innovation, continuous learning, and critical engagement within a global diverse context. These are things that came out of our discussions with that broad range of stakeholders I mentioned. We need to encourage innovative thinking, prepare reflective professionals. And one thing that really resonated with me from the Jeffrey Schnott at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard is that they have a course called Library Test Kitchen. And they don't tell their students what a library is. They ask them what it can be. And that really has resonated with me. And as a result, we're trying to integrate design thinking into um, the LIS curriculum. We have to help students understand those challenges that John described, um, and we are educating for the future, not the present. And we have to prepare gradu our graduates to successfully lead and shape our information future, not follow it, um, but actually be the leaders. We need to break down silos and create multidisciplinary uh, programs where we collaborate with others across our universities, and I think LIS programs could also share mo even more than they do. We need to share curriculum and our faculty. We need to ensure that our ed LIS educators are staying ahead of trends. Someone at our forum asked, who's going to teach 
our uh, students in the future with all this change. So we've created an opportunity for faculty fellow residencies, and maybe I can talk about that in, uh, at the June conference to give other, uh, others of you ideas who are employers to host a fellow and for LIS programs to participate. One thing I did want to note, and I think John started to address this when he mentioned the reduction of staff. Our graduates from LIS programs around the world have many skills that are useful outside of libraries and archives. So if the staff is reduced there, and what we have been seeing is a trend in some cases for libraries to hire people with other expertise. So for example, some public libraries have social workers. And just recently I saw a presentation that talked about a nurse actually on the staff of a public library. So while they may not fill all positions with graduates of the MSLIS programs, we have opportunities to, to place graduates because the skills listed here are so important in a variety of organizations. To highlight this, we were told we should raise awareness of all that you can do, and so we created the podcast series Beyond the Stacks, and uh, there will be a link to that on the next slide, on two slides down. So it really is to get an idea of all that you can do that's cool, and of those titles that Valerie noted, I think you'll see some uh, similar titles here. These are the titles that we've had on our Beyond the Stacks. Um, I'm happy to say that some LIS programs are using this in their introductory courses, and it really is to give an idea of unusual jobs. If you have suggestions of people you think we should interview, please send us an email, because we, we're looking for new, uh, interesting, and innovative careers. So, okay, that was a very quick run through. Um, here's the project website and our Beyond the Stacks link. Also, we have a blog, um, and the most recent articles have been about design thinking, which I mentioned. So, um, look forward to continuing this conversation and seeing you all in June. Back to you. That's incredible, Eileen. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, I I think what's going to happen is that we are going to get some directions on moving to the individual spaces to hear some of the, the research presented, and then we will come back here together Did to you let people know uh, the directions for the uh, end result as well. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, everybody. Sorry to push us along, but we do have presenters waiting to present. Go ahead and uh, click into the calendar for your time zone. Find the sessions you like. We're going to turn this one off and enjoy this back. And thanks, everybody. Terrific job. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. A great job on the opening panel. We're so pleased that all of you were able to join us, and we're looking forward to continuing our conversation throughout the day. Thanks.